mention too, our district is 85% white. Uh, so and it was a swing seat. So this district um, doesn't necessarily have you know, a, a direct connection to people of color, but it, it also, we also are a nation of immigrants. And I think when you share your immigrant story, you share your identity as a person of color um, authentically, um, you know, with, uh, with the intent of um, each one of us finding collective liberation, um, it's, quite, it's, it's quite inspiring to see what the results are. And we want our seat by 15 points. Yes. Sammy, I mentioned earlier you defeated a Republican incumbent who was chair of a PAC that was condemned by the NAACP for racist political ads. Um, how did racism affect your campaign, and what is it like running as a progressive in West Virginia? <laughs> yeah. how, much, how much time do y'all have and how much time do I have? One. Um, so my opponent uh, was a Republican incumbent, she was a two-term incumbent, and uh, she was the national chairwoman for an organization called Black Americans for the President's Agenda, and they ran the ads in Arkansas uh, that started with the line, um, I believe it was, yo girl, well, first off I'm already offended, but, <laughs> uh, yo girl, they be lynching white folk. <laughs> Yeah. So and, and that transgressed into uh, Democrats are, are the are the are the racists in, in this particular campaign and of course the independent expenditure that went out for uh, his name was French Hill even even he denounced the ad that's how that's how disgusting this thing was um, so when that ad hit this is also um, on the tails of quite a bit that had happened in the district and the very first attack that I had actually gotten. Uh, and we alluded to it in the in the bio. Uh, I had protested against a Confederate plaque, a Confederate monument that was in my hometown. It was on the judicial building, which, at my core, I feel that justice should be blind. And what other way can you really lift up that marginalized communities are not getting a fair shake than slapping it on the side of a judicial building? So I go in that day for the hearing to speak. Uh, I brought 200 of my friends. <laughs> uh, but I was shouted down. Uh, and of course, when, <laughs> when I wouldn't shut up or sit down, uh, there was someone that shouted from the back to tase me. They said, tase her. <laughs> and within the hour, uh, there was a, a mass email that went out. Of course, you know, folks got it back to me and it referred to me as hysterical radical Sammy Brown. And at that point, I knew, regardless of anything else that was gonna happen, that's not indicative of the leadership that should be happening in any sort of governance, um, but especially in my hometown, in my home state. Um, so folks were like, are you, Sammy, are you upset? Are you, you know, are you okay? And I was like, no, y'all, they just launched my campaign. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah, that's a great story. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do this. Uh, after that, though, uh, we had a pocket of time between that occurrence and then the, the primary, which was in May. And uh, at the time, I was uncontested in the primary, so um, I'm not one to really sit back on my morals. I was organizing during that time. I was getting ready. And uh, the first hit came from the state GOP, the, the ad, uh, the digital ad, and then the, I guess the Facebook post referred to me as a racist. Um, it, it said the Sammy Brown and the racist campaign uh, that she's running dot dot dot. Now, mind you, this was based off of some comment that a, a follower uh, had said, and I really pushed back on my opponent. Um, totally blown out of context, but the reality is they just accused an interracial female of racism, and I didn't have to clap back, although I was ready. I, I didn't have to uh, because the community is the one that came in and said, "Sammy's father is black." Sammy's been a member of this community. Uh, Sammy is an interracial female. Explain to me where racism would have occurred. And what, even though my community definitely had my back on this, what they didn't realize is this is a type of implicit bias. This is a type of bigotry to uh, say that I'm less than because I'm not as black as. And, uh, you know, obviously this also came with a learning for my community of how we're going to talk about race, gender, and sexual bias. And it was something that I wanted to perpetuate throughout the campaign, which is we aren't just here to win an election. This isn't just about flipping a seat. If we're going to break down norms, if we're going to really change how people perceive West Virginia and West Virginia politics, 
then we are going to have to systemically attack the way that we are now talking about politics in this state. So I'm not here to concern anything. I'm not here to be moderate about anything. I am here to burn it down. <laughs> Which leads me to what does it mean to be a progressive in the state of West Virginia? And uh, I am not going to paint a rosy picture for you. It is not rainbows and butterflies. It is hard as hell, okay? Um, constantly, uh, the, the verbiage is used. Uh, she's radical, she's hysterical, she's a troublemaker. Well, you're damn right I'm a troublemaker. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm gonna cause all sorts of trouble if this is, if this is what normal is for you, okay? If, if we're constantly going to perpetuate misogyny, uh, racism, bigotry, hate, if we're going to go on the house floor and literally say that gun bills are my equalizer, not education, not economic justice, a gun bill, y'all. That's my equalizer. No, we, yes, I'm gonna make all sorts of trouble for things like that. I'm not gonna be apologetic for that. But what comes with that, especially being out in front and having these conversations and even having to hold my own movement accountable, okay? There, there is a part of that as well that we should be doing as progressives. You can say that you believe in a platform or hashtag whatever progressive tagline it is today, but if you're not living those values, are you truly progressive? Are you really perpetuating a movement? Are you truly inclusive? So that on all sides has been something that I will fight for, by the way to make sure that we're taking care of one another, that we really are having this uh, a real value set at top of mind. And then changing the conversation, because conservatives are trying to also reclaim some of our verbiage. Obviously, when, when you're trying to position me as a Democrat, as an interracial female, as a racist or a bigot, you're, you're trying to claim that conversation. When you're trying to say, um, that economic justice is only about jobs, tell me jobs for who? Who are we fighting for here? Who are we actually putting to work? Are you taking care of my people? Or are you taking care of your pockets? Like, we have a whole hell of a lot of people to hold accountable, and that includes existing leadership in my state, and I venture to say uh, for my uh, fellow panelists as well. So um, it's toughened me up. It's given me really thick skin, but I keep boxing gloves in the car. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing to highlight, if you haven't noticed, is that the panelists here are very progressive. <laughs> and I want to highlight that because we got Southern state representation, we got battleground state representation, they flipped seats, they won because they were progressive. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, that takes me to my next question about making sure we do have progressive leaders um, in office. Um, so Summer, uh, you took on a 20 year entrenched incumbent, Ooh. not just by a little, by 30 points. Yeah. Whoa. How did you create that grassroots movement and what advice do you have for other women of color attempting to take on the establishment? Yeah. <laughs> so good morning. Uh, <laughs> So when, and, and I think we hear this often, so I'm not even gonna lie about it. When I, when I first started running, I did not expect that that was where I was going. Like I was on the pathway before I realized that that's where the trail was leading. So I think that in and of itself really kind of, kind of contributed to the grassroots effort that we have with our campaign. So for me, when, when, when I was running, or before I was running, I was a part of what was going on in my community. And we had a lot of stuff going on in my community. Um, as it was mentioned, you know, we had a school district where black kids were getting beat up by police officers, where we had a principal, um, we had administration who was abusing our kids. And what that would really come with was a powerlessness, because we had so many people in my community who had dealt with this stuff for so long. They had seen administration after administration. Their communities have been the same, whether it's been Donald Trump or Bill Clinton or Reagan or whoever. They've seen their communities, whether it's one borough council president or one mayor or the next, and they've seen their school district go from okay to, to bad to it's out of control now. 
And these people had for so long, they fought, they screamed, they yelled, they done everything that they could, and they couldn't, and nobody would help them to find a time, no one could find a time to help them to empower themselves. And I think that that was a difference in any grassroots campaign. Because what we did with our campaign was said that it's not about me at all. And it's not about the school board. It's not about the individual person running for school board. What we were really doing was, was we were building something that could be sustainable in our community. So when I decided to go and run for state rep, I didn't even know the guy I was running against. I had met him once in a meeting where we were talking about the school district because they saw us coming. And when they saw us coming, they were like, okay, now it's time to sit with us. That was the first time I'd ever met my rep, and he had been in office for 20 years. Wow. Um, so when we decided to, to run those school board races, we had three weeks to do something. In three weeks, we were gonna write a, run a writing campaign you know, build name recognition. In those three weeks, we were able, because we organized, because we took the time to educate people, because we took the time to include everyday folks, we were able to get almost a thousand people to come out and write in the names of the women who were running for office. What? And because of that, we were able to show our community that when we step up, we can win. So by the time it came to my campaign, we had already laid the groundwork. We were already ready to move, on, move forward. So when I ran my race, it was really just about being intentional. It was already mentioned, be yourself. I had decided that I was running as me, I was gonna sound like me, I was gonna look like me, so if that meant that I was putting these box braids in, that, <laughs> yes. if that meant that I was going to use the language that I use with my people, I knew that I can go to my people and use the language that we have to use. Um, and, and people didn't question that because people in our communities, it is not just mine, but people all over our nation are looking for people to represent them, who are them, who come from them. People are realizing that we don't have to just settle for, you know, the suit. We don't have to settle for the image of what we think a politician is. People are starting to learn that if we're going to have representative government, there's space for you. So our grassroots campaign was built around that. We were super intentional in, 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 in taking time. We knew that we had to, to educate folks. What does the state house even do? How do you build a campaign? You know, what is your what does your money go to? If you're going to donate, if I'm going to go to to poor people of color in my community and say I need you to donate to me and they had never donated or contributed to a, to a political campaign, we had to tell them what their money was gonna get them. We had to show them how that was going to impact them in their lives, but also how investing in our politics can transform our community. Because when you look at rich communities, they invest in their politics. So our campaign was first and foremost about teaching communities that had never been anything but, or expected to be anything but consumers of, of, of politics that we could be producers of our own politics. Um, so we looked at it that way as a campaign. And when we said that we were going to go and when we started, we ran the whole race as if we were winning that race. Yeah. And we did that so convincingly that even people who had, <laughs> even people in my community who had tried stuff before, they had been beat down, and they were like, you know what, you can't win in a 75% white district. We were like, no, we are winning this race, and you may come with us, or you may stay behind. <laughs> but we're going there anyways, and I hope that you're going to come. So, <laughs> so grass was Grassroots building is all about intentionality. It's all about meeting people where they are. It's all about respect. It's all about including them. It's all, it's all about making a home for people you know, who had felt like in traditional campaigns there was no space for them. Um, so what was the second part about how do women of color, people of color do this? How do you, oh wait, um, what advice do you have for other yeah. women of color attempting to take on the establishment? That part. Do it. Do it. Yeah. That, that's what it is. It's to do it. It's to say that, you know what, I have something to offer. My identity, my experiences, my perspective alone offers me and provides me a space in, right here. And if you can't recognize that, then you have to realize that those aren't those people aren't for you. If somebody can't understand your power or doesn't respect your power, then you shouldn't pander to them anyways. So for, for people of color trying to get into politics, you have to go against the establishment. You're either the establishment or you're going through the establishment. And you need to choose which one of those you want to be. Girlfriend, go ahead and drop and your mic. Drop your mic. <laughs> <laughs> but you also have to recognize that there is so much more power in the people who are, who are behind you if you just wake them up and if you take the time. Yeah. So my advice to people who are trying to go up the, against the establishment is don't cut corners. It's don't walk forward in fear. You, you have to recognize that your task is gonna be a little bit harder, but it's gonna be so much more fulfilling because there are so many politicians, so many people in office who get in because they went the establishment route, because they did that traditional thing, what, what, the, what the consultants said. They, they, they put on the face, they put on the mask, and they do that 
And you can do that, that's one route of doing it, and you'll be supported in it. But when you do it through the people, when you do it through your grassroots campaigning, it means so much more because now you've not just empowered yourself, you've not just expanded your own career, you've brought up your community. And that's what, we, that's what we're doing on the opposing side from the establishment. The establishment is about self, it's about protecting itself. We are about protecting our people. So that is my advice for that. <laughs> And that reminds me, you know, I was talking earlier um, about AOC, you know, from the national perspective, there's a lot of um, focus on Alexandra Costa Cortez and what she's done. And whenever I see that from a national perspective, I think about the summer leagues, um, because we have them in the states doing this type of work. Um, and the summer leagues and all of the people on this panel, um, and that gives hope, you know, in this Trump world, um, when it's tough to, you know, sometimes every single day, um, knowing that there's people like this and that we can do our part to help them win um, so we have this power is just so great. So um, my next question is for Elora. You are among the youngest Latinas elected in the country. Um, did you face challenges in your race due to your age? And how the heck did you run for office and give birth a couple weeks before election day <laughs> while having a full-time job and getting a PhD? <laughs> <laughs> know if your mic's up. Oh. You might have something to Um so in terms of my age, I would say that yes, there was a challenge with that initially and subtly throughout my campaign. Something that I didn't expect because I'm the type of person that doesn't ever believe in a box and I just think, you know, if you have a dream, you should go for it and just pretend like it's gonna happen just like what you were saying. Um, and my opponent, she had been on the board for about 16 years and um, she had her foundation of people and her supporters and they really believed in a set way of doing things. They, um, she was older, there hadn't been any young person really on the board, and there had been no one to challenge her. So what she decided to use against me was, well, kind of my ethnicity, we'll get into that later, but she decided to use my age as a way to show that I didn't have an experience to run a campaign, that I didn't have experience to be in a leadership position, and the way I found out was I was invited to speak at an event. I was super excited, this was my first event, like really just, you know, doughy-eyed. I went in and it was all of her supporters mm -hmm. and it was her and basically after I gave my pitch, she attacked <coughs> me as well as her supporters very verbally and it was uh, borderline harassment about my inexperience how I couldn't use the race car to get me elected, that that wasn't important, and um, I needed to wait my turn. And I'm gonna be honest, I went in my car after, and I cried, and I was like, what am I doing right now? I'm, you know, seven months pregnant right now, I'm getting my doctorate, I'm working full time, is this the right thing for me to do? But I thought to myself, again, what type of example do I wanna leave for my son. I want him to know that no matter what, you don't quit, especially when it's challenging, especially when you're afraid, because we need to be a community that stands together in the midst of fear and do the things that we feel are impossible, especially when people are telling us we can't do it. And I've always preached that, even when I was a teacher, I used to be a teacher, and how could I give that message to my former students if I wasn't willing to go through it myself? So I picked myself right back up and I decided to go to another event that she was hosting. And I picked up speech again. And I decided to use my age as a benefit to connect to my voters. And I was really surprised when I owned my age, when I owned that I was pregnant, when I owned that I was pregnant and not married. 
I connected with a lot of people. I was really surprised with the support that I had. The teachers were, re I ended up getting um, an endorsement by the teachers union and historically they never give endorsements. So that was a huge win for us. And then, you know, the support just came coming in once I decided to be myself. for all the candidates. Um, for women of color running for office, the impact of racism and sexism is an ever-present issue in their everyday lives and in the political system. What was the biggest and hardest challenge you faced on the campaign as a young woman of color, either on a personal everyday level, from a systemic perspective, or both? <laughs> <laughs> and and I'll, I'll go ahead and, and steer into this, really. Um, systemically, uh, the Democratic Party in West Virginia does not look or sound like me, and I don't think that's a secret to anyone. Um, and at first, uh, you know, as much as, as folks liked me and they're like, oh, she has this great personality, or whatever the case may be, it was never that she has legitimate purpose. It's never that she could truly lead. It's never that she was going to build this, this really uh, amazing campaign. And I remember one of the first meetings that I, I took just at the rumor that I was running, uh, the gentleman sat across from me and, and he was twice my age and he looked at me and he said, now, now, uh, you, you go ahead and wait your turn. You, you won't get the backing. Uh, that I'll get, you won't get the money that I'll get, so you just need to wait your turn. I'll hand it over to you when I'm done, though. I'm just not ready to retire. <laughs> so I paused, and I took a moment, and mind you, I did go and cry afterwards, <laughs> but it took every bit of courage that I had at that moment to look at him and say, you're gonna have, can I cuss? Am I allowed to cuss? <laughs> You're gonna have, I won't cuss because there's people last year. You're gonna have <laughs> the bloodiest effing primary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he did fine, by the way. <laughs> um, but what I had to do in that in that moment was really claim that I am I am just as formidable, if not more, to take this seat that this is my community, I grew up here, I was raised here. Of course I know the people of my community, and I'm gonna go get them, I'm gonna go get them. Uh, as far as uh, kind of what was going on. Personal everyday. My parents were so angry, they were scared. It, it wasn't a, I'm so proud that you're running. It, you know, I come from an interracial family. They knew that what we were up against, they knew what I would be, what I would be faced with on a regular basis, and they were absolutely right. Um, I got that and then some. And when they would see the comments and you know the death threats or the um, you know what part of Africa is she from or um, you know the, the the bitch cunt sluts or the you know she's a playmate or whatever that. Sorry about the language, uh, but it was on Facebook, so I mean <laughs> they didn't have a problem typing it. Um, they. I, I was more concerned about what that did to the people observing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It wasn't so much that it hurt me, although it did, and there were plenty of days where I sat back and, and, and thought to myself, did I really do the right thing? But in reality, of course I did. Uh, of course, putting myself out there and showing other folks that this can be done, that you as a, as a woman, you as a young woman, you as a young woman of color, not coming from means, I grew up on the, you know, the wrong side of town, um, that of course that you can take your place and, and win, not, <laughs> not just by a little bit, by a lot, by knocking thousands of doors, heading through your clothes, sitting at people's kitchen tables, and having conversations that matter to them. The fact that folks felt seen for that, for that moment in time, and hopefully, uh, you know, I've done that as a representative to continue lift up their voice. But to to claim that 
um, was inherently important. And so all of that, that filtered feedback and the, and the ugliness is temporary and on, well, it's ongoing to be frank, but mm -hmm. you, you see this and you endure it, but the only way to, to clear the path for others to do the same things that we all did is, is to face that and face that head on and, uh, and own it, and own it. Um, and I'll, I'll add to that, um, and I'll give two perspectives for him. One echoes Sammy's points, um, and just in our own family, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, so, you know, when I first made a decision to run for office, um, like all good plans, they, they, they never actually fall together. And so we had an original plan to announce on August 1st of 2017, and then my Republican incumbent opponent decided to run for Congress, and he did that on June on June 30th. He knew we were coming, so he wanted to get out of the race and uh, run for something else. So we pulled everything up, and we announced on July 3rd of 2017. And um, when that happened, it, it, there was no time to kind of like get the party's blessings. You know what I mean? Like we didn't talk to the Democratic Party. Um, I had been a member of the local party. I was a DC board member for three years. Like I, I to your point, you know, you know the local folks, right? But in Tallahassee, folks were really just uh, um, leading with judgment. I mean, they were making comments like, oh, she'll never raise $40,000. The mayor will never endorse her. She doesn't know, doesn't know business, how is she going to win? Because um, the assumption to that point was the Democrat who could win this seat would have to fit a certain vision of what a winner looks like. And that was someone who is um, white, male, uh, tall, name ID, you know, um, fit, you know, just kind of fits that like pol pol political look, right? And here I come in, like, you know, brown skin, long hair, like doing my thing, and uh, uh, trying to redefine what a winner looks like. And sure enough, that first month we raised $50,000, we earned the mayor. Thank you. We earned the mayor's endorsement in September of 2017, and and have just you know rock and roll since then. We are we raised 523 thousand dollars in our campaign from more than 4 thousand individual donations. Um, and so you know we ran our own political machine that was driven by the grassroots. We took no money from fossil fuel companies, no money from big sugar, um, and and we spoke about that you know as a part of our values. So there's just this work we have to do uh, systematically within our own movement, within our own family, to redefine what a winner looks like and inspire other people like us to run for office and keep challenging that and keep challenging that, not be intimidated by um, you know, what the status quo has been, but to really transform it. And then there's this piece of um, governance and now being a young woman of color in the legislature. And I know everyone has stories on this too, so I'll, just, I'll speak to in Florida, so we have, you know, I was on the Florida House, 120 members, 47 Democrats. And um, the majority of women of color are Democrats. Um, and uh, uh, there were so many assumptions made about me. And it was the same thing on the campaign trail too. And I, I so relate to folks, you know, trying to paint you as radical and extreme. And um, I love some good trouble. Um, but at the same time, at the same time, like I, I, I get the sense that we're all very collaborative people, right? Like being a progressive is also being inclusive, and that includes being inclusive to people that don't always agree with one another. Like that's my values, right? Like I'm open to feedback as long as it's tied to our collective liberation. If you're just being a troll, then I'm gonna meet you on Twitter. But um, <laughs> never block, never block. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 uh, I came to the legislature with those same exact attitudes, but my goodness, like the, the box that people try to put me in. And, um, uh, and, and it's a very top-down process in Florida, so as a, as a fresh minority Democrat, you don't get anything. Um, you know, none of my committee preferences were given to me. I had a really bad parking spot. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was placed in the corner of the House floor. Like, the press gallery can't even see me from where I am. Like, it's, it's all intentional. Um, and to the point where, I kid you not, a Republican colleague came up to me. He was like, you know, I, I actually really like the stuff that you say. Do you want to maybe talk in front of your desk, though? Because we can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> it was like advice, but also like, oh, yeah, OK, that makes maybe sense, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, maybe you should put me somewhere else. But um, I feel so, every bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's about, it's about like telling your own story, right? Before someone else tries to tell it, tell it for you. It's about taking up as much damn space as you want. 
um, and not being afraid of that. Um, and, and, and also like being, uh, trying to have empathy. And I know that can be tough, especially um, when you have experienced so much trauma in your life. There's this really beautiful um, poet called Nahira Wahi. She has a book called Salt, and I like keep this po poetry in my bag. And one of her poems um, just speaks to how, you know, her identity as a woman of color, um, she has been so tortured, she has been um, through so much pain that she has every permission to burn down this earth. But she chooses not to because her, her desire for humanity, her passion for humanity far exceeds the rage that she holds. And that's the approach that I feel every day. It's like, I love, I love my state. Like, I love the people of this great state, even though they don't agree with me. I love you. And I think if we leave with those type of values of inclusivity, of empathy, that I can put myself in your shoes, even when we disagree, and try to find something we have in common, trying to build some bridge, but also holding one another accountable. And I'll close with just, you know, one other moment that I think kind of like reflects this. Um, there was some small tension on the House floor. Not everyone's listening on the House floor. Like, that's the harsh reality. And, and I'm, I'm standing the whole time. I'm watching. And there was a Republican colleague who had a bill, a really, like, decent bill about red tide and wanted to start, like, a commission to research red tide. So, you know, I'm just watching, listening. And then one of his Republican colleagues, who's, like, very to the right, um, uh, was questioning him about the, the, how this wasn't necessary. So I was like, all right, let me give this guy like some backup. So I just put my mic up and I was like asking him easy questions, lift up why that bill was important. Unplanned, I was just like, this is a good idea. Like he should get, you know, the credit for it. So he comes up to me afterwards and he thanks me for doing that. But it was funny because he was like, your parents should be really proud of you. <laughs> my mom passed away when I was 13, um, which I talk about all the time. So it's like part of my personal identity is part of the pain that I hold. So first of all, that's a little triggering, right? Because it's like, are you not listening to what I talk on the floor? Because I, most folks know about this story. But it's fine, like empathy, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, oh, well, thank you. Why, why would you say that? And he was like, well, you're really polite. <laughs> and we'd be like, when was I not ever polite? You know, but again, it speaks to this assumption about because I am young, uh, brown in a Democrat in the legislature, there was an assumption that I'm going to be competitive, I'm not going to be someone you like to talk to, and many folks automatically label me as the Florida AOC, which, oh my goodness, right? That's a compliment. Like, that's a compliment, but it depends who's giving it to you, right? When Democrats say it, it's usually a positive. When Republicans say it, it it's their way of dismissing you, right? Because they don't take AOC seriously. And I tell folks all the time, it's actually A V E, and and to just you know again like lift up your own identity in this movement um, while also not leaving anyone behind. And and, and from that one um, experience with that with that colleague, um, you know though it was it was condescending in a way, right? Because it was grounded right. in his systematic perspective of me. I hope it'll be transformational for him, right? I hope when we come back next session. He's gonna maybe want to do a bill with me. Maybe he'll like ask me how my day is, right? Like those small moments of just getting to know one another and, and hopefully trying to um, really find a conclusion to these polarizing environments and actually trying to get things done. It's kind of wild, actually, now that we brought it up, that how collaborative uh, folks mm. across the aisle find us to be. But it takes <laughs> them a while. Totally. It, it yeah. takes them a minute and they're totally. like, oh, wait, what? Yeah, I, I, I really like that. I think I first I don't know. 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 I don't I don't think that I have had the same experience as a lot of people of color running. Uh, which is lucky. I don't put that aside. A, I have a lot of stuff going on. I'm poor. I'm black. I'm a woman. I'm a socialist. <laughs> there are no boxes. There are no boxes. It's a, you're like trying to fit me in a Rubik's Cube. And, uh, I think that throws people off sometimes. That said, let me just say that you, we hear often about how the, the Democratic Party is a, is a big tent, right? This Democrat, this tent is so big until women of color who are young and progressive show up. So, so we need to talk about that. Because when we talk about systemic racism, when we talk about sexism, when we talk about ageism, we oftentimes look at the other out, and we don't stop and look from within, and we don't look first right in front of us. 
And when I talk about the, the systemic racism that I experienced, I'm not a Republican. So the systemic, the systemic barriers that I face didn't come from Republicans. It came from my community. It came from the Democratic community. It came from the progressive community. Because realistically, there's anti-blackness in everything, in every grain, every fabric of American society. So when I ran with that, the, the most racism that I felt, I didn't need anybody to call me a nigger. I didn't need anybody to talk about my age or that I'm a woman or that I'm poor. I didn't need any of that because I exist in that world every day because I have to carry racism around with me everywhere I go. So every day that I'm running on a, that I'm running a campaign, I have to remember that I carry on my shoulder my whole community and that I'm also standing on the shoulder of people who came before me. So for me, I weaponized, and I don't have any shame in saying that, yes, I weaponized my race, my gender, my, my identity, because those are the things that make me. Because those are the things that make me who I am, that make me worthy of standing here on this panel or, or being at the state house. So before anybody could ever use that against me, I made sure that they knew that this is what makes me the candidate for the people right now. That I have already navigated through the white world, I've navigated through the, what, what is called the elite world. I've, I've actually had these experiences, whereas so many politicians who aren't like me, the ones who fit that, that stereotype of what a politician is, they don't know anything about us. Right. We're nothing but a stereotype to them. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I found out most is when I got to the state house, because I didn't really get the whole racism part, because nobody's going to be, not too many people, are going to be bold enough to come up to someone like me who has been upheld throughout my whole life as somebody's exceptional Negro. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm double college educated. I went to Penn State and I went to Howard Law. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the person that people hold up as a, oh, well, they were all just like you. Mm. But what they'll do is, is what I did and what I knew and when I got to the state house, what I saw firsthand and was able to now point out is that you look at me and you try to hold me up as the excuse for why you don't understand. Well, if you made it to Howard Law, why can't those other people make it to Howard Law? They don't need general assistance because you made it through poverty. Or they don't need, we don't need criminal justice reform because look, you grew up in that neighborhood and you're okay. So I think when that's I called tokenization. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They're worse for it. They're absolutely worse for it. Um, but that's the racism that I experience most. It's not necessarily personal, though it's always personal. Um, it's not necessarily overt, though it always is too. Um, but the thing that I care about most, because I don't care about personal attacks, and, and, and like you all said, it's worse for my family. Like when my mom reads yeah. comments, she's the one who gets upset, but I love a troll. Um, but she does that. So I, I, feel, I feel for my family if they have to see it, but it's rare. What I don't like is when I'm sitting in the state house and the people who are supposed to be my allies tell me that, you know, oh, well, you shouldn't bring this to light or, you know, well, you shouldn't yeah. be upset about this particular bill, even though I know it's going to criminalize black people who are innocent. You, you know, you should just, there's a billionaire who's going to come after you because, you know, you're standing up for, for, for people who are innocent, who are vulnerable. That's the thing that, that's the, the systemic type of racism that really bothers me in, in, in campaign and electoral work. Because the people who are supposed to understand, who their whole image of their, of, of, of their identity is that they understand it, that they are the party for all of us, um, is actually a fallacy. And I think that until we are able to tackle that, I think we all know how to tackle that GOP type of racism. You cut that off, you suffocate that. Mm -hmm. How do you tackle that implicit bias? How do you tackle those, that, that image that our own party has of us? And what we know is, is that as women of color, and, and, and we're not even supposed to be here. Right. You know, and that, that's the racism that hits us beforehand. We're not supposed to be here. Right. You know, they're looking at us and they're like, that district's not for you. You know, you have to, I hear this so often, you know, we need someone who fits this district, yes, who fits this district. We need someone who, who fits this role. And for some reason, it's never us, <laughs> but we fit the votes. Every time it's time for us to vote on November 6th or May 15th or whatever day it may be, on, on that Tuesday, you know, suddenly we fit what they need. Um, so that's the type of racism and sexism that we need to combat right now. And I, and I know that we will all focus on, on that overt racism, racism. But when we want to advance women of color in, in politics, we need to talk about that other sort of racism that, that, that cuts us off, that coddles us and, and hugs us, but also tells us, like, no, you should do something else. Um, so that's what I see more of in, in my time. I, just, I felt every bit of that. Because like I, I mean, and we had this conversation yesterday when we were at Emily's list, where it was like Black and Latina voters are all of a sudden, you know, we're the rib 
of the Democratic it's Party. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. We're all citizen parts of the academy, but then why, why can't we lead? Yeah. What, what's up with it? And then, why don't we eat first? What, right? Can I, can I eat? Am I allowed to eat at the table anymore? Uh, and I, you know, especially having just gotten out of session, that I would constantly get that feedback of, don't be vocal. So, so yeah. here I am, a local proponent. You haven't been used to that. You're used to your legislator sitting there in the seat, occupying the space, but not going after things, not seeking justice on your behalf. And all of a sudden, I'm I'm the bad guy. I'm a troublemaker because I said, hell no. Like, come on. I don't know about you guys. They tell us to basically live another day, like live to die another day. So when we have a big that vote, that's going to impact the us's of the room and the world. They're like, well, you know what? You're better here. Did not here. I'm like, well, if I'm, if I'm, if would I be better here if I can't ever vote for my people or vote for justice? Yeah. What is the use of me being here? You just want here that so here thing. in the seat. Like, you just want me to do that yeah. and not just be, be here. Look nice. Okay. And, and I want to give some solidarity. Cool. I'm not sure what it was like. What it's like for y'all in your first session, but our freshman class in Florida was pretty <laughs> phenomenal because I, I mean, this energy is is across the country and across the state yeah. and. You know, we had a pretty large freshman class, mostly women, women of color, and there was, and, uh, we elected our first lesbian in Florida, our first open lesbian, so there were like all this great, like, like these moments of stress do happen, constant, but I, I just want to kind of also honor like the solidarity that I'm feeling right now, but also the solidarity in these chambers, and that's all because of grassroots efforts, like, these type of candidates don't win because they're taking the typical donations, right? These candidates win because they've inspired a local movement, and we just gotta keep doing it, and keep doing it, and keep doing it. Agreed. Oh, Laura? <laughs> um, so, I would say I agree with pretty much Closer everything to the they mic. said. I agree with pretty much everything they said, so I, I won't go over that. Um, what I'll focus on is uh, the fact that I really had to make myself relevant. Um, first, I, you know, I am a pretty shy person, which is weird because I do everything that puts me in the So the first obstacle really is just getting past your self-doubt and doing something that is scary. So I really just always tell people when you're in a good mood, make that really hard decision because once you make it, you can't go back. <laughs> um, and so staying relevant, I... There was an opportunity for me to run for a higher office, but I, my background is in education, and I, being a former teacher, really understood the impact and weight that your local school board has directly on the students. And um, I wanted to see immediate change versus a change that would take longer to implement, and so I intentionally made the decision to run for a school board. Um, I'm the type of person that acts as though I, in the campaign, was running for president, though, because I had to make sure that everything that I did was emphasized and elevated, because within my party, as you guys spoke to, I wasn't, people weren't batting an eye towards me. They weren't giving me recognition. They weren't including me, and it <coughs> took me having to put myself out there for people to actually start listening, and I did so that I started, I was being invited to the table after a few months of really, you know, <laughs> attending meetings, making myself known, um, emphasizing why school board really, really actually did matter. And I ended up getting endorsements from national organizations, local organizations, grassroots, um, but I think what really helped me to do that was getting out of my own way and really making sure to focus on, you can do this. This community hasn't had anyone of color who has represented it in decades. These children deserve to have a role model. This is not about you. This is not about the fact that school board doesn't seem relevant. <coughs> These kids need you. And so I would just say like, even if something doesn't seem to be flashy, doesn't seem to be, you know, possible, if you're passionate about it, you should really go after that. And you mentioned earlier um, that ethnicity, that you were kind of attacked for that in your campaign. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, so early on, one of the biggest things that I focused on was it is astounding that there has been no representation 
in our district is over 90% students of color. And, you know, I gave my reasons why. And constantly from my opponents and people sitting on the board, their supporters, I would hear it directly through social media, but it was a constant um, message that race doesn't matter. These kids are doing just fine. We're, we're Democrats. We're, you know, looking out for their best interests. We're not harming them. And my, and, and there was one comment that a woman said, well, we did have two Mexican school board members, you know, in 1960-something. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, really, it's 2019, and it doesn't matter if you've had two school board members. They need two school board members every single year or more. We need to make sure that our school board represents our students and our families. Um, and I was constantly told that I was using race as my card and that I, again, was not qualified to run. And I would say, you know what? Race is not my card. I am Mexican and I'm gonna use my story and being Mexican is part of my story. Mm -hmm. um, and so it wasn't a card that I was pulling out. And so I had to continuously combat that, which I, I laughed at pretty much because these were supposed to be friendly faces, people who were Democrats, people who were progressive, and they were trying to shut me down because I would constantly talk about my ethnicity and how that was important for students of color. Thank you. And I'm just thinking about that in the context of Arizona and like so many things that have happened there with both immigration and obviously that's something. Yeah, you just have to wait. Okay. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, th thank you. And we're running, we ran out of time. <laughs> um, and of course, oh, we wish we could talk so much with this incredible yeah. panel. The fact that we're all in the same room is so amazing. Um, and I just want to, as to wrap this up, do a couple of quick shout outs. So my team, Rachel and Keila, who worked really hard on this. Um, Marge Baker, who's our executive